the rain poured upon the stone streets of the old town known as Death Watch as I walked alone through the town center with a trench coat over my shoulders. Looking around, I saw the twisted architecture of the place that made every structure look slightly distorted, as if they were all curving toward the road. Despite me being in the town center, I saw almost no sign of anyone besides the occasional candlelight in a window or homeless leper. Speaking of the windows, I noticed immediately that they were all barred. I originally came to this town with the intent of uncovering the truth behind several deaths of people throughout the area. You see, I am a small-time reporter and getting the scoop on a story like this could mean that I could make it big. However, taking the first walk through town changed my mind. The place reeked of sewage and sulfur, along with a bitter howling wind that's sharp and piercing. Accompanying the wind was a blanket of cold air that coiled around me and seeped through the seams of my clothes and into my bones. Walking past the town square, now I managed to get a better idea of the town's aesthetic and noticed that it had an unusually Victorian-style look to it that is so beautifully gothic that you'd mistake the time for being of the 1800s. This only made me feel even more uncomfortable as I looked around at the houses I passed and saw only eyes looking at me with a mixture of fear, intrigue, and hostility. My heart started to pound as I walked faster. I never liked it when people stared at me. I was so busy thinking about the people staring at me that I didn't end up getting startled by a dog barking in an alleyway. Looking over, I saw a stray dog that was so thin that I could perfectly see the structure of his skeleton through its patchy skin. This sight was enough to make me start looking for shelter. When I looked around, I didn't see a motel or any sort of lodging whatsoever. However, I was surprised to see that an older man had opened his door for me and was smiling with a candle in his hand. Not thinking twice, I moved over to the man quickly and thanked him. He told me that it was no problem and offered me some tea as I sat on his couch in the living room. The interior of his house was very peculiar indeed. Everything seemed to be tilted at a slight angle, as if he lived on a hill. However, I do not recall there ever being an incline on the street that he lived on. It was a very slight slant, but a noticeable one. The furniture all had thin and spindly legs that intertwined in a very organic way and formed patterns and insignia that I did not recognize. The walls and ceiling were all a beautiful cream color, with several gothic paintings depicting different women. All of the women in the paintings sat in an upright position and had a blank expression. The strangeness of the place was enough to put me on edge, but that feeling of strangeness was balanced by the old man's kindness as he brought me tea inside of a fine china cup with abstract monochrome colors on it. He asked me about my job and I told him about what I did as a reporter and asked if he heard anything about the strange deaths in the area. What he told me is that there is a serial killer in town that often strikes on rainy nights like this. I asked him if he had seen this killer and he described him as being a rather tall man with a lifeless stare that's similar to that of a predator sizing up its prey. I asked about any other distinct features the man might have, but the old man told that I'd know the stare when I see it. With that information in mind, I decided to stay at the old man's place for the night. He had an extra guest room and his hospitality is uncanny. Surprisingly, the guest room was quite nice and, as I compiled all the information I had thus far in my notebook, I took one look outside to see the rain running down the surface of it, making an intoxicating white noise. I stared into the void for what felt like hours. However, my state of relaxation was short-lived, 
for through the darkness, I felt something staring back at me. No, not at me, through me. In the distance, a couple of blocks away, I saw a tall, dark figure standing there. This disturbed me enough to make me close the blinds, and I curled up on the bed as I considered telling the old man. As if my thoughts beckoned the man himself, the old man knocked on the door and asked if I wanted any more tea. Approaching the door, I happily accepted the tea and started to tell him about the figure that I saw in the distance. His face immediately turned grim as he suddenly went to every entrance in the house and blocked them off one by one. Panicked, I simply waited in the guest room for him to return, and when he did, he didn't look too happy. Looking at him, I asked about our next course of action, and he told me that it's best that I find somewhere to hide. With his words in mind, I looked around for an ideal hiding spot within this peculiar place. In my search for a place of concealment, I discovered the many shadows within this house that were hidden only by the cognitive bias of my visual intellect. Choosing carefully, I decided that it would be best if I hid within the pantry. It was quite large, and I could lock it from the inside if I had to. Through the slight crack between the two sliding doors of the pantry, I could see the interior of the kitchen. A couple of rooms over, I hear the sound of the old man walking around with a large object in his hand. I'm not sure what he was carrying at the time, but I like to assume that it was a weapon. One by one, I heard the sound of the lights in the place being flicked off, until the kitchen was turned off and I was met with a sheet of never-ending black before my eyes. With only my ears to provide vision through the enigma, I waited several minutes before hearing the sound of something getting knocked over a couple of minutes later, followed by the sound of glass breaking. Slightly shaken by the sound, I started hearing the muffled sound of fighting before I'm suddenly given a jolt of adrenaline from the sound of a gunshot. Afterward, I heard the blood-curdling sound of a blade going into flesh for what felt like hours. Frozen in place, I just sat and listened, praying that whatever entered the house wouldn't find me. After that grueling experience, to my surprise, I was met with silence. I was almost relieved at the fact that it was silent, until I realized that I never heard the creature leave the house. As if my thoughts once again projected into reality, I saw the kitchen light come back on, followed by a note that was pressed into the crack between the pantry doors. Opening the note, I read the contents of it to see that it said, Living Room. Standing up, I waited until I heard the sound of the front door opening and closing before I mustered up the courage to look in the living room. I vomited as soon as I saw what was there. The old man from before had a bullet hole through his head, and his body was severely mangled by a sharp object of some kind. On the wall was an arrow, drawn out of blood, that pointed toward the center of the room. All I saw in the center of the room was a carpet. However, it didn't take me long to put two and two together, and I ended up pulling the carpet back to see what's underneath. What was hidden underneath the carpet was a trap door. Still shaken by what's happened, I decided to test the trap door to see if it was open. As expected, it was locked. That's when an idea came into my head. If this was a secret room that the old man didn't want me to see, he wouldn't have a key just laying around. I knew what I had to do, but the idea of it disgusted me. I knew that the key to that room would be on his corpse. I hesitated there for a long time until curiosity got the better of me, and I ended up walking over to the old man's body. 
Kneeling down, I reached into his pocket and felt an old silver key. Taking the key from his pocket, I then inched toward the mysterious trap door. As one would expect, the door opened as soon as I inserted the key. Beyond the frame of this once hidden was a small room that reeked heavily of rotted flesh and sulfur. Climbing down, the first thing I did was look for a light switch. After feeling up the walls a bit, I found a small switch and flicked it. The contents of the room still make me sick until this very day. What I saw were several corpses spread throughout the room, with hundreds of large flesh chunks missing from them. There was so much blood on the floor that it started to pool at my feet. The most disturbing part, however, was the fact that each body was completely deboned. Scanning the room even more, I saw that he had a small forge down here as well. Walking over to it slowly, I felt my heart drop as I saw what the old man was crafting at this forge. Around the forge were tiny little fine china bowls and plates that were a nice off-white color, the same color as human bones. At this point, I couldn't help but vomit. I drank tea from one of these things without even realizing I was putting my lips upon the bones of the deceased. Thinking back to it, I never drank the second cup of tea that the old man offered to me, and I wondered what my fate would be if I had. I must have stood there for hours because, by the time I climbed back onto the main floor, it was morning. Whoever that killer was from last night saved my life and revealed who the true monster was all along. After that night, I ended up leaving that town and never coming back. Once I was a good distance away from the town, I ended up calling the police and telling them everything about what happened there. They investigated, but all evidence of the murders was wiped clean, and eventually the investigation was dropped altogether. Some nights, as I sit here, and type my many articles about the strange happenings of the world, I can see a dark figure outside my window, wandering my neighborhood. Instead of fear, I felt a slight comfort, because I knew that some sick bastard was going to meet his end. The morning after, the crimes would be revealed at the murder scene through a series of cryptic messages. It's around that time that I got my idea for a new story. I made the headline, Wandering Vigilante Fights for the People of Wales. The story ended up becoming viral, and I now own a small news outlet. Everything seemed fine until one of my secretaries complained about a strange man with a sinister stare stalking her. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you want to see more, let me know in the comments below, and tell me what you thought of this narration. Make sure to follow me on Twitter for updates, and if you'd like to get early videos, shoutouts, and much much more, I'd appreciate it if you check out my Patreon page. It's a place where you can help support my channel while getting awesome rewards in the process, and every pledge helps out a ton, no matter the size. So if you'd like to see all the rewards I offer and consider becoming a patron, it'd mean a ton to me if you'd click the link in the description and just check it out. And don't forget to show some love to the amazingly talented authors who make these narrations possible. Have a good night, everybody. Cheers.